Well, again, we are in the book of Revelation, and we are still looking at Ephesus because we're looking at the Nicolaitans who actually show up in two of the churches. So I was doing most of the study about the Nicolaitans uh, here in this first church, the church at Ephesus. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. <clears throat> Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will move thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that once again as we look into your word, you will cause your word to be the spotlight that shines into our hearts, examines what is there, commends that which is approved, and rebukes that which is evil. We thank you, Father, that you gave these seven epistles to the churches of Asia Minor, that our Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself as the Lord of the church, the one who holds the seven stars, the angels of the churches, in his hand, the one who is over all of the churches and examines them carefully, whether or not they are revealing him and him alone to the world around us. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, of course, last week we had Valentine's Day Sunday and saw a special DVD on Boy Meets Girl. But the last time we were in Revelation was on February 4th, where we looked at part two of the church at Ephesus. Now, I'm sorry about the confusion at announcement time this morning. The last bulletin announcement two weeks ago said that we were studying the church at Smyrna. We didn't actually get to Smyrna. Uh, as you know, that announcement was wrong at that time. We were still looking at Ephesus because we started looking at the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So last time in Revelation, we're really looking at Ephesus part two. Tonight, we're still in Ephesus. So it's the church at Ephesus part three, if you're taking notes. We'll see more about the Nicolaitans when we study the third church, which is the church at Pergamos. But meanwhile, in the letters to both Ephesus and Pergamos, the Nicolaitans are mentioned. We want to notice a very important emphasis there is a twist backwards to frontwards and frontwards to backwards as you look at these two churches, Ephesus and Pergamos. With Ephesus, the deeds of the Nicolaitans are mentioned, although Ephesus was a doctrinal church. Ephesus itself emphasized doctrine, but Christ emphasized how they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. With Pergamos, the doctrines of the Nicolaitans are mentioned, but Pergamos was actually involved with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And we're told what those deeds are when we get over to those verses dealing with Pergamos. On January 7th, we began our study of the seven churches. These letters are directly from Christ 
to seven churches of Asia Minor. Uh, what we learned about Ephesus was very instructional for Bible Presbyterian Church here in Collingswood because the church at Ephesus was a doctrinal church. They knew doctrine. The book of Ephesians is one of the most, two most important doctrinal epistles dealing with the sovereignty of God and with the doctrine of election. Romans and Ephesians are those two epistles. The people at Ephesus were very clearly very hard workers. So are the folks here. They exercised church discipline. They were reformed in their theology. They obviously believed in predestination and election. They had much to commend them, but they acted on the basis of law and not on the basis of love. They were part of the bride, but they'd lost their love for the bridegroom. In some ways, they were like Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. I think that this letter is the letter that Christ might write to our church. Jesus warned the church at Ephesus that he would remove their church if they did not return to their first love. Because the issue is not the machinery and structure of the church at Ephesus. The issue was love for Christ, which was proved by obedience, not merely obedience in a mechanical fashion. So the key point that we learned as we looked at that overview of Ephesus is loss of love demands repentance or death and church dissolution. And that, of course, is a serious warning for us if we are similar to the church at Ephesus. Mechanical Christianity, with lots of programming, can never replace love for Christ. The issue is motivation, not machinery. Also, as I mentioned in our initial two overviews, there are four overlays when we study the book of Revelation. They are not mutually exclusive. Some people have only focused on one or the other. They are an overlay that's like a tapestry. They are the direct interpretation, in other words, written to seven literal churches, the historical interpretation, that is, they outline the basics of church history, the church type interpretation, that is, the seven letters list seven types of churches at the time of the apostles, and those types of churches are still around today, and finally, the church application ap interpretation, so when you got the first three in place, we see that placing that application on top of everything results in two issues. Number one, the purification of the church, and number two, the preparation of the church for Christ's return. If you have all four of those things laid out on top of each other, the application ultimately comes out for the purification of the church, don't be like the bad guys, be like the good guys, purification of the church, and number two, since Revelation is dealing with the return of Christ, it's preparing the church for the return of her Lord. We talked about the seven different um, periods of church history that these represent. We looked at the church analysis. We saw some progressions between the seven churches, both positive and negative. Uh, Ephesus hung in there. They hated the Nicolaitans, but they'd lost their first love. Smyrna, spiritually rich, eyes open, but they kept hanging in there too, very close to Ephesus in that. Pergamos, there were some faithful martyrs who had hung in there but got killed for it. But their eyes were not open, and for them, the Nicolaitans were okay. Rather significant to see that when you move from Ephesus to Pergmos, you suddenly slide into accepting things that were no longer taboo, so to speak, in the church. You know, I was talking with somebody today about how standards in the church today have truly slipped. You know, I can remember when I was growing up, being in a church, and it wasn't even a, you know, what would be called a Bible church. It was a denominational church where my father was pastoring. But the standards for people coming to church were so very high. And they were always truly reverent. And the ladies all dressed in dresses and wore hats. And the men always wore suits and it was like, we have come to worship, and nothing else will distract from that. Now, my dad was the preacher, so it was a good Bible-preaching church, but I look today at churches where people come in barefoot, where people come to church in shorts and jeans and halter tops, and I think, you would have never heard that back in the 1950s when I was growing up. Never. You'd have never seen that. I mean, that wasn't considered church. People dressing for the beach. 
walking into church. Even down along the coast, in Texas we called it the coast, up here you call it the shore. <laughs> but even you went down the coast and people went to church, they weren't dressed in their swimming suits ready to dive into the surf following the service. Things tend to slide after a while, folks. And um, that's clearly what we see going on between Ephesus and Pergamos. Pergamos had some faithful martyrs. They'd actually been put to death. But they were getting spiritually dull in their sight. And as a result, they were buying into some of the modern theology of the day. It's not modern. It goes back to Balaam. We talked about that a little bit. It goes back to Balaam. And it's the kind of thing that permeates probably 50 to 60% of so-called churches today in the United States. The big mega churches. Why are they so big? Why do they have so many people? Why do so many people feel good about going to church? and wiggling their bodies and waving their hands and dancing to strobe lights and listening to stuff they call music. We'll get into that when we get over to Pergamos, but the doctrinal church of Ephesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The church at Pergamos celebrated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans and it ended in lascivious deeds, deeds versus doctrine. You know, those two things are always closely tied together. You've heard me say this for the last 10 years. What you really believe is what you will practice. If you don't really believe it, you won't do it. But if you really believe it, you'll do it. And if you believe loose doctrine, you will end up with lascivious practice. If you believe sound doctrine, it will control the things that you do. If you hold to it firmly, Deeds versus doctrine. So Ephesus and the Nicolaitans, verse 6 and 7. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God doesn't say he hates many things, but this is one of them. He hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You see, the church at Ephesus, because it had sound doctrine, because it tested people, it said, we're not going to end up there. We're not going to do those deeds. We've got sound doctrine. We know better than to do that. Pergamos celebrated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They didn't have sound doctrine. They had some martyrs, but they didn't have sound doctrine. Smyrna, of course, the Nicolaitans are not mentioned, but they're under persecution, and normally uh, false doctrine doesn't last long under persecution. People are not willing to die for false doctrine in most cases. Third, at Pergamos, the Nicolaitans had not only gained a foothold, but were a curse on the church, verses 12 through 15. To the angel of the church at Pergamos write, These things hath he which has the sharp sword with two edges. And down in verse 14, he says, But I have a few things against thee. Now, to Ephesus, he said, I have somewhat against thee, and he mentioned one thing. But here's what he says, multiple things against the church at Pergamos. Even though they had martyrs, even though they were fighting with the devil himself, Satan was living there at Pergamos. I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Nevisus said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. To Pergamos, he said, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Because doctrine ends in deeds. And he tells you what kind of deeds they were doing, which tied you back to Balaam. Now, the, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about the Nicolaitans. We have this passage here uh, in the book of Revelation in these two churches. But the Bible says a humongous amount about Balaam, the son of Basar, and how he defected from having contact with the living God and sold out for pleasures of the flesh. So, looking at them, we're going to discover there's a parallel also to some Galatian heresy, but it's more parallel to the doctrine of Balaam. We saw the only two sources for information about the Nicolaitans are church history. Some have suggested that it was 
Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, out of Acts chapter 6, verse 5, one of the seven first deacons. Uh, and we talked about how people object to that, and they say, well, how could he fall away? Well, of course, Paul said the elders at Ephesus, the good church, number one, that the elders, there were going to be some of them that rose up and tried to split the church. So, skipping over Smyrna, looking at the doctrine of Balaam, it's set in parallel to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We saw that the first error of Balaam was, and it begins with a C, can anybody remember it? It's one of the seven deadly sins, which in the seven deadly sins we say greed, but oh, I'm sorry, I gave it away. What did you say? Covetousness. Covetousness. That's very closely tied to the prosperity gospel, and when we get to Pergamos, we're going to talk more in detail about specific people and specific things that are going on in that movement. Some of you saw part of that when we showed the series uh, by Dave Hunt on the various cults. Um, but um, the prosperity gospel of many charismatics who say name it, claim it. Balaam was willing to twist his relationship with God to get money payments from Balak, king of Moab, and to get honor. Remember, Balak, king of Moab, kept saying to him, if you had only cursed Israel, think of the incredible honor I could have given you. Now, you know, the Olympics is going on right now, and it's a tremendous honor, not only for the athlete who wins, but then they honor the athlete's uh, country. They put him on the middle stand there with first place in the middle and then silver and bronze on the sides, and then they play the national anthem of the country of the athlete who wins first place. And, of course, uh, it's a great honor. Balak is saying, I will give you honor, not just money. <laughs> and Balaam's saying, well, look, if you gave me a whole house full uh, of, uh, uh, you know, full of silver and gold, like I couldn't go against the word of the Lord. But in his heart, he's thinking, yeah, but I sure would like to have that. We find out later how he tried to get it. Very sit because it tells us what happened. It tells us specifically what he got Israel involved in because he knew that if Israel, he couldn't curse Israel, but he knew that if Moab could get Israel involved in certain kinds of sin, that God himself would judge Israel. It's a warning. You know, there are people who infiltrate churches who try to get members of the church involved in certain kinds of sin so that God himself will judge them. They know God's not going to curse them, but if they can get those believers involved in certain types of sin, we'll talk about those a little bit later, if they can get them involved in those types of sin, God himself will send judgment. He won't have to curse them. You know, the devil is not as strong as God. When the devil is doing battle with God, who wins? God always wins. So the devil thinks, Man, I can't get through to God's people. He's putting a hedge of protection over them. What am I going to do to get through to God's people? Ah, I've got an idea. All I have to do is get them out from underneath the umbrella where God is protecting them by getting them to do certain types of sin because I know that God always judges those types of sin and he can look back to the wilderness wanderings, which we're studying on Sunday mornings, to the different types of sins where Israel committed those sins and finally God killed them. So he thinks, I want to get rid of the effective Christians. The way to get rid of effective Christians whom God is protecting is get the effective Christians involved in sin. And it'll be one of the, and maybe two, maybe more, of the seven deadly sins in which he gets you involved and then God will come in and judge you. He won't have to go through the the warfare. He won't have to fight with the other angelic beings on God's side. He won't have to fight with the prayer shield, the, the faith shield, and the, 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 sh the prayers that the saints are sending up, and praying for each other, and praying for themselves, and the spiritual battle of Ephesians 6, all he has to do is get you to walk out from under God's protective hand, and he's got you. That's what Balaam did. Of course, it didn't last for very long. We'll see that when we get a little farther on. So we looked at Numbers chapter 22, and we read through most of that chapter of chapter 23, too, and where twice Balaam is going up to uh, try to curse Israel and the story about the donkey talking to Balaam. We went all through that. And then um, we had the third story in Numbers chapter 23, uh, the third incident. There are a lot of chapters dedicated to Balaam and he's mentioned multiple times in the New Testament too. 
where Balaam said to Balak, build me seven altars, prepare seven oxen, seven rams. And they did it. And then uh, he comes back in verse 8 and says, how shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? But he keeps thinking to himself, there's got to be some way to get the money. There's got to be some way to get the honor. Man, the Moabites are rich. I mean, they got a lot of money. What am I going to do to get this? What am I going to do to get myself a position in that society? I'm tired of living out here in the desert all by myself. It would really be nice to be in one of those cities over there in Moab and be able to do what I want to do. And so that brings us to verse 22 of chapter 23. Now, let me read you just a couple of verses before we get to that. These are verses we looked at last week. Numbers 23, beginning in verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Now, God had already said he's going to bless Israel. And Balaam is struggling with that. I know he's going to bless him. That's all I can tell you. He's going to bless him. You're not going to win. He's going to bless him. Balaam gets really frustrated with that. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed. I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. <laughs> Whoa, that's going a stretch. But God looked at Jacob and Israel under the blood of the sacrifices which he had ordained. And those covered until the final sacrifice, which was given when Christ came and died for our sins. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. And then this is where, that's where we left off last time. That brings us to verse 22. Now notice this phrase. God brought them out of Egypt. This is Balaam talking. In other words, the memory of the Exodus was known to all the pagan nations we studied that. We talked about all the passages where God said, I'm going to let all the pagans know this so that they will fear me. I'm going to let all the pagans know this so that they'll know I'm greater than the gods of Egypt. I'm going to let all the pagans know this. The message is going to go out in front of you. Remember when Joshua crossed the, the Jordan River 40 years after it took place? What did Rahab the harlot say to them? We heard how God brought you out of Egypt and what he's done to all those nations. When you've been trampling around for the last 40 years. 40 years later, the pagans still knew about it. And Balaam, in his prophecy here, says, God brought them out of Egypt. A major point about, is made about that in Scripture. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what hath God wrought? <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell, of course, uh, stole that phrase when he spoke the first words into the telephone that he had invented, what hath God wrought? Well, it was not about the telephone, it was about Israel. Uh, what hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Balak's really getting uptight now. He's really getting frustrated. Balak, Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. I can't stand any more of that blessing stuff. You know, when the world is like that, they really have a simple solution. Balaam doesn't give it to Balak, and Balak doesn't pick up on it. But if that's the kind of God you're dealing with, wouldn't it be smarter to get right with God? <laughs> wouldn't it have been better for Balak to say, you know, the God of Israel is a powerful God. We have heard all that stuff. We heard about them coming out of Egypt. We've heard about everything that's been going on. Why don't we turn to the God of Israel instead of turning to the gods of Moab? But you know, the pagans never seem to want to do that. You've got friends that you've witnessed to. You've shared the gospel with people. And they instead want to fight it and see if they can't find holes in the gospel. 
That's Balak. He's looking for a loophole. He's looking for some way that he can curse Israel, but if he can't curse them, at least don't bless them. We don't want to have more trouble than we've already got. Listen, God was going to do what he did, whether or not Balaam cursed or blessed Israel. Because God controls the end from the beginning. He doesn't just know it. Nothing would happen if God had not acted first. Suppose God, instead of making Adam and Eve, made Bork and Zog. <laughs> so here's Bork and here's Zog, and they both have two heads, and they both have 16 arms, uh, and they're both green. Would any of world history as we know it today have happened? Would you be here tonight looking like you currently look? <laughs> I think not. It would be really funny to see this whole room full of green people, you know, with two heads and 16 arms sitting out there waving around and one eyeball in the middle of the head. Nothing would have happened if God had not acted first. God acted on the basis of his eternal plan to produce exactly the chain of events that have come out in history which bring him the greatest amount of glory and the greatest good for his elect. So that he might demonstrate in a practical way his love and grace. But if there's no sin, there's no way to show grace to sinners. God's not responsible for sin, but God made people, and he made Satan, who fell from heaven of his own volition, tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell too. And so God is able to manifest his holiness and his judgment and his righteousness against sin. God is able to manifest his grace and his mercy for sinners. God has it all together so that in the end we give him the glory and don't take it for ourselves and he receives the greatest amount of glory at the expression of every one of his attributes because all creation will bow before him. Someday even the devil's going to bow before him. It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Balaam sort of has an inkling into that, but he knows something about the character of God, that God is a holy God. And so he's going to teach Balak what he needs to do to get God to judge the children of Israel. And Balak does it. We'll see it a little bit later. And the children of Israel come under the judging hand of God. Balak doesn't win in the long run, but Balak causes the death of many of the Israelites because he follows the advice of Balaam. Balaam got his reward. Balaam got the payoff. We'll talk about how long it lasted as we get a little farther along. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down to eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told I not thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. Balak doesn't give up. And Balak said unto Balaam, Okay, come, I pray thee, I will bring you to another place. Peradventure it will please God that he may curse me them from thence. <laughs> he said, Well, don't bless them, don't curse them. But then he says, Man, I still got to try at it. I'm going to give a shot at it. So Balaam, Balak brought Balaam up to the top of Peor that looketh toward Jeshimon. Now this is a key verse. It's at this place. He can't curse them. But it's at this place that he gets the idea. At Peor. Baal Peor. It's at this place that he gets the idea that he gives to Balak, which he's going to be able to get the children of Israel to sin so that God kills a bunch of them. He brought him to Peor that looketh toward Jeshimon. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars. Prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. Same type of thing as before, and Balaam did as Balaam had, Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. Now we move to chapter 24. The story of Balaam goes on for a long way in the scripture. When God gives this much 
time to something, this many multiverse chapters, it's because he's trying to teach us something, and this guy is picked up in the book of Revelation when we deal with the Nicolaitans and the church of Pergamos. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tent according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. You say, whoa, this guy Balaam? The Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of God that moved across the face of the waters in Genesis chapter 1. The, 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 the separated darkness from light that, uh, is involved in creation. It's also the Spirit of God that came upon Saul, you remember? And Saul prophesied. He was going out to kill David. Not a very good motive to go. And, and he came, and, and here were the sons of the prophets, and they were prophesying. And Saul fell down among them, and he prophesied. For her it was said, Is Saul among the sons of the prophets? The Spirit of God works in different ways with people in the Old Testament. He comes on them and he leaves. He comes on them and he leaves. Different reasons, and we've talked about that some in the past. Now the Holy Spirit dwells inside every believer permanently. He comes into you, not just upon you, not just to give you power. He comes and lives inside of you to transform you into the image of Christ, and he never leaves you. He permanently indwells the believer now in this age. But here we find the Spirit of God coming on Balaam. Verse 3, And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said. Now you know this is really interesting. What did we just touch on briefly? I'm not studying Pergamos fully yet, but I'm trying to give you foundation so you'll see when we get from Ephesus through Smyrna to Pergamos, so you'll see what's going on. What did we learn about Pergamos just in passing? I talked about, here's Balaam, his eyes are open. Pergamos, their eyes were closed. Here's Balaam. At this point, the Spirit of God comes upon him. His eyes are open. He lifted up his eyes. He saw Israel abiding in their tents according to their tribes. The Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. He emphasizes it twice. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth, as the gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lin aloes which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters, he shall pour out the waters out of his buckets, his seed shall be in many waters, his king shall be higher than Agag. Agag. How many of you know who Agag was? Hacked to death by who? No. Samuel, Agag, has, has Agag shown up on the scene yet at this point? No, we're still in the wilderness wanderings. Samuel's in the day of Saul and David. Years later, hundreds of years later, we've got a real prophecy going on here. He's naming a man hundreds of years in advance. The Spirit of God, it says, came upon him. This is a guy who's getting genuine revelation from the living God, the Spirit of God. He's a man who's in contact with God, and yet we're going to discover he turns incredibly heretical for some carnal things. He's willing to bring a curse on God's people so he can get rich. There are people in the church today like that. They, they just want the money, man. They just want the money. They want the honor. They want the prestige of being the church, the mega church pastor. They're willing to make any kind of compromise that is necessary so that they can get the goodies. He had a vision of the Almighty. 
He had his eyes open. He looks and he sees, how goodly are thy tents. And then he says again, now remember we saw this at, back in verse 32. He says again, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Now look, Egypt was more powerful than Moab. Egypt was more powerful than Midian. Egypt was more powerful than all these other nations around there at the time of the Exodus. Egypt was number one. And God brought Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. You understand why the nations were terrified? Do you understand why Balak here is desperate to get some kind of help against Israel? He ought to have repented, but he didn't. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, <laughs> the goyim. He shall break their bones. He shall pierce them through with his arrows. He couched. He lay down as a lion, as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? This is not very friendly kind of talk. Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. What's he going back to? Do you know what, he under, what he's quoting here? And he wasn't alive at the time to hear it. What is he quoting? Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 17, and Genesis chapter 22, where God makes the Abrahamic covenant. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. God states it over and over again. Then he repeats it to Isaac. Then he repeats it to Jacob. That's what Balaam is quoting here. Abraham, around 2000 B.C. Israel leaves Egypt, 1400 B.C. It was a promise that God had made 600 years before. It's incredible. Balaam in contact with the living God, and he gives it up for money. How many people have given up a spiritual blessing, infinitely valuable, to get something in this world. I suspect every one of us, including myself, and I'll find out someday when I stand before Christ, I don't know off the top of my head what, what I've given up in terms of spiritual riches, but for something in this world? Balaam is the example for us to avoid like the plague. The man whose eyes were open. He who blesseth, blesseth thee, and curses is he that curseth thee. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Now therefore flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor. Now, now, listen to this next thing. Here's an accusation against God. This is one of the danger zones. But lo, the Lord, and he uses the covenant name of God, Jehovah, has kept thee back from honor. I wonder how many of us have ever wondered, why didn't God give me that? Why did he give it to somebody else? I mean, they didn't deserve it. I really deserved it. God kept me back from honor. God kept me back from money. God kept me back from, from marrying the guy I wanted to marry, or from marrying the girl I wanted to marry. And the Lord kept thee back. Don't you get it? Why do you serve this God? He kept you back. Oh, how little Balak knows. But it goads Balaam. How can I get around the curse that God has told me? Now, he uses the right words here, talking to Balak. He, he defends himself. Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. <laughs> you can tell where his thoughts are going. Balak has just been talking about honor. Balaam is talking about money. Balak talks about promotions. Balaam talks about gold and silver. And he talks about a lot of it, a whole house full of it. You can see where his thoughts were. I mean, honor, what's that worth? I mean, hey, that's okay for, you know, two or three days. But, hey, at the end of that, you've got to pay the bills. And, you know, um, 
Now, I might run up some pretty big bills if I had a lot of money because I'd really enjoy myself. If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. And now, behold, I go unto my people. Come, therefore, I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Now, that's a very important phrase in Scripture. When you're talking about the latter days, you're talking about the end times. So he's not only looked all the way back 600 years and heard what God said to Abraham, otherwise else would he have known it, a promise God gave to Abraham 600 years before. Like if somebody said to you, what promise did King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella make to the co-pilot of Columbus's ship? Uh, uh, do you know? Uh, you don't know, neither do I. We don't even know if he made a promise to him. I mean, we know some of the stuff about Columbus, but I mean, the co-pilot, I mean, the, the navigator, the steersman. Oh, what, what promise did... Could you quote it? No. But God gave it to a man whose eyes were open. The Lord Jesus Christ talked about that quite a bit. The Pharisees and the scribes who knew the Bible were criticizing the Lord Jesus Christ and talking about how they really knew the scriptures and Jesus says, you know, if if you could see you would not have the problems you've got but if you were blind you wouldn't have condemnation but you say you can see therefore you have a greater condemnation are your eyes open? We each need to ask ourselves that question because that's really key here to Balaam. Have your eyes been opened to the Word of God? How many of you here think your eyes have been opened to the Word of God? You've, been, you've trusted Christ. Now as you study Scripture, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal things to you in Scripture. I know everybody's scared to raise their hand. <laughs> okay. If you've trusted Christ, your eyes have been opened. Now the question is, are you going to shut them? Are you going to let things of earth blind your spiritual sight and your spiritual hearing? Are you going to become hard of hearing, dull of hearing, the scripture says? You've been made alive. Your eyes have been opened. Your ears have been opened. Your tongue should also be opened to proclaim the truth of the gospel. But how many of us, because we want to protect our temporal things, never open our mouths? Balaam. Balaam. This is what's going to happen in the latter days. He took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open, here we have it again, hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. People, why does it emphasize that five times? I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. Because this is coming in the future. Now listen, who do you think this is? It's Balaam speaking, remember. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Who are we talking about? Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is 1,400 years before Jesus came. 1,400 years. More than that, actually, because this is close to the beginning. Before Jesus came. It's Balaam who's talking. And yet, when we get to the New Testament, we find Balaam tied in with the worst kinds of curses that God can place on a man. 
because he defected from the faith for stuff, for things of earth. That's a warning, folks. That tells us how dangerous this is. And shall smite the corners of Moab. Remember, we're talking about Balak, king of Moab. And destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession. Edom. Edomites are descended from whom? Esau. So we're back to the days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And now he's looking forward to this one who's going to come out. The, the, the scepter is going to come out of Israel. The star rising out of Jacob. Edom shall be a possession, Seir, that's uh, what we know as Petra, also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations. Amalek, who's Amalek? The Amalekites and the Moabites, where'd they come from? Lot! The incestuous relationship with his two daughters. Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenites shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away. He's foretelling the Assyrian captivity. That's around 700 BC. That's 700 years after this prophecy. You can see why, why the liberals don't like prophecy in the Old Testament. Because it's real prophecy. It's not like you know, three months in advance he prophesied this. Asher shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Kittim, and shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber, and he shall also perish forever. He's talking about the whole Middle East. He's telling you what's going to go on all around the Mediterranean Sea. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. Now, for a moment there, look back at the church at Pergamos. What did it say that Balaam was going to do? And I've got that written on another sheet here. Just a second, let me find it. Here we go. Here's what they're going to do. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And here are the two things. To eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now remember, the last place he was at was Peor. So, let's read about that happening. Numbers chapter 25, very next chapter. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Balak, king of Moab, couldn't defeat Israel. But he said, you know, there are a lot of fine-looking young men down there, and you got a lot of pretty little girls and you know it would be really something if your little girls went on down there and they decided to have some boyfriends among those Israelite boys. And you just get those Israelite boys doing bad things with those Moabite girls and God will take care of those boys and you won't have to fight them because God will kill them. Fornication. Eat things offered to idols, commit in fornication. What do we find here? And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. That's precisely what it said over there in the book of Revelation. Comparing the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to the doctrine and the practices of what Balaam taught Balak to do. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, that's 
the master of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Balak, listen. Just try this. I can't curse him. But try this little tactic. Send your girls down there. They'll see girls coming. They won't fight the girls. The girls will go down. They'll be wiggly and they'll look really nice. And some of those boys will say, hey, pretty nice looking chicks. And they'll say, oh, we, we brought you some things that we've, we thought you might like to eat. And, of course, we've been sacrificing them to our gods. Maybe you'd like to do that. And, you know, the way our gods work is if, if you worship our gods, you can do all kinds of things that, you know, maybe in, your god won't let you do. And the boys down there said, that sounds like a plan to us. And what happened? The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Listen who was involved. It wasn't just the common people. The Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. So you get rid of that problem, you kill them. Balak was never going to have to kill those guys. God made sure they were dead. He killed the leaders who had allowed this stuff to take place. That's rather serious. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianized woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Pinchas, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, so he's the grandson of Aaron. He rose up from among the congregation. He didn't just talk about it and say, oh, how sad it is. Look what they're doing. It's really, really, really bad. And he took a javelin in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust them both through. The man of Israel and the woman threw a belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Oh, so not only did they hang up the heads of those who were allowing this to take place in the camp, there was a plague too. Listen to this. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Balak could have gone to war with Israel and maybe after huge long fights of many days, having a lot of his own men killed, maybe he could have gotten a death toll of 24,000. Maybe he could have killed off some of the heads, some of the princes. Maybe. He didn't lose one man. You see, God is a holy God. God won't tolerate this kind of sin. And you know, folks, he won't tolerate that kind of sin in the church either. There will be people who die. God himself will send the judgment. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Pinchas, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. If Phineas hadn't done what Phineas did, God would have killed them all. Balaam, the son of Bosor, whose eyes were opened, five times were told it, he saw what God would do. He knew how to affect it. He gave the information to Balak. He says, look, I can't curse him, but look, here's what you do. Send the girls in. Don't send men in. They'll kill the men. Send the girls in. They'll like the girls. You've got a lot of sharp-looking girls here in Moab. A lot of Midianites living among you. Send some of them in, too. Midianites were a, a mobile tribe that moved around. And God killed 24 Israelites. Didn't take long to do it, maybe a couple of days. One man turned 
away the wrath of God because, in our terms, he was an extremist. He didn't just think about it. He didn't just pray about it. He did something about it. He saw somebody flagrantly committing fornication in the sight of Moses and all the camp, and Phineas said, they're not going to do that here, not on my watch. And he took a javelin, and they're laying down, and he ran them both through, stuck them together like a couple of hot dogs, dead. And that turned aside the wrath of God. One person, get it, one person can make a difference in a church. One person can make a difference in a country. One person can make a difference in a family. If you are zealous for the Lord, your God. This is all the background for what we're looking at in Revelation. We only have these passing references. But this is what we're looking at in Revelation. Wherefore, speaking of Phineas, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. Wow, what a blessing. And he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, it wasn't just some anonymous guy, that was slain with the Midianitish woman was Zimri, son of Salu, prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. He was a big name. Nobody's going to touch him, man. He's, he can do what he wants to do. The name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. Hey, you want to make the other side mad? Go kill a princess. You want to make your own side mad? Kill one of your top guys. Want to make both sides mad? And you think you're going to get run over? Kill one out of each side. God said, I'm going to give him everlasting covenant of peace. I'm going to give him an everlasting covenant of promise. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles, whereby they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. Wow. Now let's, oh man, our time is up. <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, the riches that Balaam got and how long he enjoyed them. <laughs> because that brings us then to the New Testament. But we're going to have to close with that and take it up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. It is a reminder to us that you are a holy God. You do not monkey around with sin. You hate fornication. You hate adultery. You hate all the perverted forms of immorality that are taking place in our nation today. Oh, Lord. It's astounding you have not yet sent a plague on this nation, wiping out a huge number of people. Not just people. Wiping out a huge number of your people. It was the Israelites. 24,000 of them were killed. Not 24,000 pagans. Father, we thank you that your hand of mercy has been upon the church. And yet, Father, in many ways we see the handwriting on the wall and we see it happening to our country. We see the end approaching. Father, make us brave, like Phineas, to whom you gave an everlasting covenant. Father, please spare this church. Make us once again your people who are zealous for the holiness of God. 
For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn. Let me find that page again. Number 605, much in line with our theme, Living for Jesus. 605, we'll sing all four verses. Let's stand.